The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Agatha Christie and George Simeon present the best in mystery storytelling. Each show will be full of suspense, intrigue, and of course mystery. Now let's join our featured mystery. Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. There are times, my dear Georges, when a disappearance is more expected than unexpected. Indeed, you. If, for instance, a solicitor was known to be embezzling his client's money, you'd expect him to disappear. Mm, turn up again, somewhere like the Argentine, as Monsieur Dorf? Oh, don't say that happened once and we've both forgotten. Uh, Monsieur Dorf? I don't remember such a case. We wouldn't forget a case, would we, George? Of course not, George. <laughs> uh, this chap, however, was a solicitor, and his wife expected him to vanish at times, only nothing was as it seemed to be. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon in Maigret and Monsieur Charles translated by Marianne Alexandre Sinclair and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam. Chief Inspector, hmm? there's a woman in my office who insists on seeing you personally. She won't tell me a thing. No, Paul Laporte. Has she got a name? Well, she gave me a card. Uh, here. Ah, uh, Madame Sabin Levesque, 207 Boulevard Saint Germain. Oh, it's a good address. Mm. Well, she seems sort of peculiar to me. Sort of peculiar? Well, yes, Chief. She she stares straight at you as if she had trouble in seeing you. Mm, well, I'll ask her to come in. And bring your shorthand pad, just in case. Eh? Yes, Chief. The Chief Inspector will see you now, Madame Sabalavet. Mm, I'm sure she'll object to my pipe. Chief, this mm. is the lady. Oh. Oh, well, do sit down, please, madame. Thank you. Well, madame? Do you know who my husband is? Well, except that he has the same name as you, no. He's one of the best-known solicitors in Paris. Oh, do make a note of that, Le Uh, yes, Chief. Mm. I suppose that young man has to stay here and write it all down. My husband has disappeared. Well, in that case, madame, you should have gone to the Missing Persons Bureau. Have you been drinking? I must say I expected you to be more understanding. Look, to understand, I must know... I had know two glasses you... of cognac to give me courage. Hmm. When did your husband disappear? On the 18th of February, over a month ago. Uh, what did he tell you? <laughs> Nothing. He never did. You see, I'm used to him clearing off for several days at a time. Good Lord. Hmm? You have a question, Le Bois? Oh. Uh, well, yes, thank you, Chief. Hmm. Uh, do you mean to say, madame, that your husband goes away on journeys and doesn't tell you where? He doesn't go away. He stays in Paris, or sometimes the suburbs. I used to have him followed. It was always the same thing. How long has this been going on, madame? It began shortly after we were married, 15 years ago. And you see, my husband's like that. He has these fancies all of a sudden. He meets a woman he likes, and he feels the need to live with her for a few days. Uh, where does he find these... Fancies. In the clubs, the nightclubs. To which she doesn't take you? We've meant nothing to each other for years. And yet you're worried. For your own sake? For his sake. I don't love him anymore, monsieur, but I'm worried for him. A month is a long time. He took nothing with him, not even a small suitcase. He didn't even take one of the cars. 
Well, I'm afraid something may have happened to him. Your husband is a successful solicitor, you say. What happens when he does his regular disappearing? He isn't at all like the usual solicitor. He inherited his father's firm, and the head clerk can run everything. How old is your husband? Forty-eight, monsieur. And as fit as a young man. Do you know if he had a lot of money on him the day he disappeared? Not for sure, but I doubt if he had much. He used his checkbook and his cards. Mm. What does the head clerk think? I don't know. I haven't asked him. We're not on good terms. Well, we'll ask him. And we should pick up a trail in the clubs. You find me complicated, don't you? <laughs> I don't know, madame. I haven't thought about you properly yet. Have you any money of your own? No. <laughs> oh, my husband gives me all I want. I couldn't swear to it, but I think he's very rich. Hmm. Well, you look tired. I am. I'm always tired. Perhaps I should get back. Yes, yes, perhaps you should. Look, if you don't mind, I'll come and see you at your flat this afternoon. I have a nap after lunch, so come at about four. Mm, that's fine. Tell me, what is your first name? Natalie. I have some Russian blood from my mother. Natalie. Have you ever been happy, Natalie? No, never. I don't know the meaning of the word. Good day, Monsieur Maigret. Oh, good day. You will come alone. Yes, I'll come alone. Oh, uh, allow me, madame. Shall I call a taxi for you? No, I have my chauffeur waiting. I remember the way out. Good morning, then, madame. Ah. Well, what do you think, Chief? Oh, I think she was badly in need of another drink. Do you believe her story? I mean, her husband going off the way she said. Why not? A strange woman. wonder if she's a little mad. Did you think she was a bit cracked jewel, or were you just satisfying Lapointe's curiosity? <laughs> it seemed the best thing to do. No, I thought she was intelligent, but... An alcoholic, for sure. When once she'd been very attractive. Her marriage sounds like a marriage of convenience, but it obviously wasn't. Let's assume there was love to start with. Mm, only after a while he had to revert to his bachelor habits. I needed to know his husband. Needed to see where he lived. Needed... But you had a feeling he was dead. No, not really, George. Only that uh, something strange was going on. I needed to see his office, too. It was on the floor beneath his flat. So, in the afternoon, I called in there and spoke to Le Cureur, the head clerk. The first day of spring, monsieur, and behaving as the first day should behave. Mm, true, monsieur Le Cureur. I walked here. It was positively warm. Nevertheless, I think I should close the window. The noise... Yes, monsieur. He sees all the clients personally. He never gives the impression of being a busy man, and yet he works harder than I do. Incredibly shrewd, too. And I suppose you take over his work when he's away. It's my duty as his head clerk. Uh, there are, however, certain things I can't sign, so at the moment it's rather awkward. When he went away in the past for a few days, he kept in touch with you. Hmm? He always rang me to see if he was needed. Uh, Chief Inspector, I... I wonder if I have the right to go into things. Uh, professional etiquette, you understand? Look, he's been gone for a month. He could be dead. You think he could have been murdered? His wife seems to think so. Mm. The idea crossed my mind, too. Well, if you were worried, why didn't you go to the police? I began to get worried two weeks ago. I rang Madame sabin Levesque to tell her I was, and I advised her to get in touch with the police. Well, did you? What did she say? Oh, there was nothing to worry about yet, and... Uh, She'd take care of the matter in due course, whatever that meant. You don't get on well with Madame, I take it. No. B but it's not just that. It's, um... I'm, I'm sure I shouldn't be letting these uh, cats out of the bag, as it were. Look, I know so much already, and we need to find your employer. So? Nobody here likes her. 
that no one in this office or among her staff upstairs, except for her maid, Claire, she, uh, she doesn't fit in. She's a sort of uh, discordant element in the place. Do you understand? I'm not sure how sane she is, and, uh, of course, she drinks like a fish. Well, there it is, Chief Inspector. We all should feel sorry for her, but we can't. Uh, thank you, monsieur. It's time. Just on four. I must have a few words with her in a moment. A couple of things before I go. Do you think your employer rented another flat uh, here in Paris, I mean? I'm sure he didn't. I would have known. So, when he vanished, he vanished to the place where the lady lived, or to an hotel. Did any of his ladies ever ring him here, you know? I asked our switchboard girl about that when I first became worried at his absence. There never have been any calls. So, he must have used an assumed name. A different name for a different life. It's not unusual, of course. Oh, thank you, monsieur, and I'll take myself upstairs to our Natalie. Oh, I never knew her name was Natalie all these years. Will you have a brandy, Monsieur Merkley? Not at the moment, madame. Tell me, does your husband have any enemies that you know of? <laughs> Only me. <laughs> what do I know of his life, Chief Inspector? Nothing. We haven't shared a bedroom since three months after I married. They all love him. And you hate him? Well, not really. It was just the way he is. I made a bad mistake. Are you his heir? Yes, his sole heir. If he's dead, I'm a rich woman. But why didn't you ask him for a divorce? Too lazy? Too indifferent? You don't want to drink? Cheers. Now, these clubs he visits to pick up, shall we call them his girlfriends? Do you know any of them? He's left matchboxes with the names on them lying around. Let me try to remember. Chap Beauté. Belle <laughs> The Quick Crack. Hmm? Are you sure you won't have a drink? No. What I want, madame, is a photograph, a recent one, of your husband. Uh, some over there, on the desk. Oh. I've been looking them out. Do you forget faces so quickly, Natalie? <laughs> I never even let them register. Not anymore. I thought you might want a picture. Oh. This one of you. When was it taken? <laughs> that. <laughs> a few weeks after we were married. I've changed, haven't I? Where do you think your marriage went wrong, Natalie? I'll take these two of them if I may. Perhaps I never understood him, so I couldn't handle him. Perhaps he was mistaken about me. In what way? He took me for a different kind of person. What did you do before you met him? I was a secretary in a lawyer's office. Maître Bernard Dajon, Vue de Rivoli. That's how I met Gerard. Gerard? My husband's name. <laughs> Didn't you know? Oh, yes, of course. But I'm trying to think of him with his other name. The one he used when he went off on his little adventures. Oh. Yes, he must have had another name. I wonder what. Where are you going to start looking? Don't you want a drink? No, thank you, Natalie. I wonder what he took you for, apart from a lawyer's secretary. Lapointe told you about the missing solicitor, eh, jean -Pierre? He has, Chief, and about the wife. The wife, yes. Now, she told me that before her marriage she'd worked for a lawyer in the Rue de Rivoli. I called there on my way back just now. Only one old concierge could recall the lawyer. He's been dead ten years. But he told me that the lawyer only ever had one secretary, an old lady, now living in the country. And she said that's how she met her husband. Yes. I wonder why she lied. It's an unnecessary lie, Chief. Unless she has something to hide. Yes, yeah, Chandrier, it is. You know, nobody seems to like the poor bloody woman. I saw Sabin Levesque's head clerk, who obviously loathes her. Unless she's a good actor. Meaning what, Chief? Well, they could be in it together. They've had lots of opportunity, and she stands to gain a small fortune, so I gather. You think he could be her lover, and the whole thing's a vast con between them? Mm, 
doing well is to keep the idea in the back of our mind, shall we? Now, one other thing. The head clerk said he spoke to our Natalie two weeks ago about his boss's long absence. She told him there was nothing to worry about yet. Hmm. Did you ask her about the conversation, Chief? No, no. If they were in it together, there'd be no point, would there? If not... <laughs> now, what do you think, Lapointe? It's... it's as if she knew something. It is, isn't it? So, we have to keep an eye on her. jean I'd like Chief. you to go to the Boulevard Saint-Germain as soon as you can. Follow her if she leaves the house and have a car handy. I'll get somebody to take over from you later. Yes, Chief. Uh, can you give me a description? Well, she's quite tall, dark, rather thin, with staring eyes. Good-looking once, but now she looks as though she's been drinking. Well-dressed, good furs. I'll be on my way. At least the weather's warm. Now, you and I will visit one or two clubs tonight, La Pointe. Oh. Pick me up at 11, will you? Go home, get some rest now. Oh, right, Chief. Oh, by the way... Madame Natalie phoned while you were out. Oh, what did she want? Well, she sounded as drunk as a newt. She said she just wanted to tell you to go to hell. <laughs> good evening, monsieur. Oh, good evening, Marco. They let you out, have they? Oh, it's you, Chief Inspector. Mm. Oh, I do wish there was more light in the club. What can I get you? A beer would be acceptable. And uh, is this young man your son, monsieur? <laughs> Inspector Lapointe, Maurice Mocco. Ah, how do you do? Uh, I'd like a beer too, please. You are on business, I take it? Mm. You know uh, this chap, by any chance? Two beers, monsieur. Huh. Oh, uh, allow me to put my spectacles on. Uh, take the photographs over to the light. Here's help, Papa. Oh. How many times is it you've been taken for my son? Oh, I've ceased to be embarrassed by it, Chief. Uh, here's help. Yes. We know this gentleman is uh, Monsieur Charles, Chief Inspector. Monsieur Charles? Mm. Now, when did you last see him? I've been away for a little while. Hmm? No, Chief Inspector, not where you think. I returned to Corsica to see my old mother for the last time. Oh, I'm sorry, Marco. Uh, what do you know of Monsieur Charles? I will tell you. Not a regular. We don't see him, perhaps, for a month. Very charming, cultivated, and obviously wealthy. Martine, one of our young ladies, was supported by him for a few days. She'll be in shortly. She can tell you herself. Now, last summer, we had a very pretty girl here, Leila. She did not go with the customers, not that any of the girls are required to, you understand? Mm. Monsieur Charles offered her 10,000 francs, and when she refused, he put the price up to 15, and then 20. She refused, being Leila, but he could hardly believe it. I was watching, of course. I thought he was going to burst into tears. 20,000 francs? This was for a few days? Oh, yes, the usual two to four days. Only with Leila, he wanted to take her to a country hotel, of all places. Oh. Ah, of all places. <laughs> That's interesting. Le Bois, he could be sitting in some quiet country hotel. Holding hands with his latest conquest. Oh, it's a pretty picture. Something has happened. You are looking for him? Uh, he's vanished, Marco. Oh. Hadn't been seen for over a month. I wonder what his real name was. Ah, there's Martin. Martin, do come over here, my dear. Oh, hello. <laughs> Ooh, I like the young one. I think I've seen the old one. Uh, the old one is Chief Inspector Maigret. <coughs> the young one Inspector is... Inspector Lapointe, Martin. Now come and sit down. Oh, thank you. <coughs> what can we get you to drink? Uh, I have a martini, of course. A martini for martini. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yes, mm. I see. <laughs> well, bottoms up. Yeah. Mm. Oh. So, you're the famous Maigret. You going to ask me some questions? Oh, go on, do. Yes, I will, Martine. Do you remember Monsieur Charles? Oh, yes. Girl doesn't forget the Monsieur Charles of this world easily, believe you me. It wasn't his real name, was it? No, it wasn't. Mm. It isn't, I mean. And what's happened to him? Yeah, I liked him. What's he done? He's disappeared. So, so these questions are serious? You could help us, perhaps. Yeah, when did he do his vanishing act, then? Well, he left home on the evening of the 18th of February. The 18th? Uh, 
Oh, look, that's funny. Oh, look, you, you, you won't believe me. Oh, try us, Martine. What is it? Well, all right. The 18th is my birthday. Well, that's why I remember the day and the evening. You see, I, I have a girlfriend, or, or did have, she's gone to England now, called Doreen. She came in here to see me on the 18th, you know, wish me happy birthday, give me a present. She was all dressed up, and I asked her where she was going. And she said she'd met this man, Monsieur Charles, and he was taking her off for a few days, meeting her at her club, the Click Crack, in an hour. Oh, I didn't tell her I knew Charles. Perhaps she guessed that I did. A lot of us round here do know him, of course. So he met Doreen in the creek crack. Oh, well, that's just the point. He didn't. What? She rang me the next day. Awful upset she was. Really, she was. He never turned up. Now, she waited until the club closed, but he never turned up. And he never even sent a message. Now, it was the 18th. I'm quite sure of that. So, it seems he didn't go off with any girl on the 18th. Yes, yeah, only planned to. Hmm. Another martini, martini? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Monsieur. Uh, two more beers, Michael. I remember one thing. Hmm? He used to uh, walk to the club so somebody could have waited for him. You know, that crazy wife of his could have done anything. Oh, he told you about her, did he? Your beers, Monsieur. Oh, thank you. Martini, Martini. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Ah. Oh, bottoms up. Mm. Oh, yes. mm. oh. Ah. oh, poor Charles. If anything's happened to him... I'll... Where did you stay together, Martine? Oh, my little flat. That's what he wanted. He used to talk about himself in a vague sort of way and about his wife who drank. He thought she'd grown a bit mad, but it was as if he hardly knew her anymore. He spoke of her as you do of a stranger. Was he a lonely man without many friends? Oh, he had friends, but not in Paris. He had a house on the coast somewhere. Oh. I don't think he was lonely, not really. <laughs> he was rather like a young chap. Someone who'd never grown up in some ways. <laughs> we were like a couple of newlyweds during those four days. He, he watched me, you know, having a bath, getting dressed. Yeah. <laughs> as if he'd never seen a woman before. And he, he'd, he'd lean out of the window to see me leave when I went shopping. And when I got back, I'd find the table laid. I was very considerate, just like a real sweetheart. And left, he gave me some money. It was a lot of money to me. Morning, Chief. Oh, good morning, jean I Hope you're feeling better than I am. Ah, yes, Chief. I feel up once. Anything to go by? He complained I was shouting when I was only saying... I that... thought you were shouting, too. Oh. Well, never mind. I'm growing too damned old for these nightclub sessions. Come and sit down. Now, how did you get on outside the Sabin Lelec residence? Uh, nothing much until 11. I was parked about 100 metres from the house, had a good view of the entrance. She came out just after 11, wearing a mink, and from what I could see of things, a nightdress underneath. Walking uh, very stiffly, like a guardsman. Well, where was she going, for God's sake? I got out of the car and followed. She went to the phone box on the corner. She had trouble getting through, but when she did, she had a long conversation. Seven and a half minutes, to be exact. Mm. Then she marched back, rang the bell, and was immediately let in. Well, did you see who opened the door? A man, medium height, swarthy, wearing the bottom half of a uniform, I'd say. Boots, grey trousers. Oh, that'd be the chauffeur. I've got his name here somewhere. Oh, Vittorio Petrini. We need to talk to him, I think. La Pointe! Oh! God, my head. <coughs> you you called, Chief? Yes. You look terrible. I've asked some coffee to be sent out. Look, I think a walk would do you more good than coffee. Oh. Now, go and get the Sabin Levesque chauffeur in for a few questions, will you? Yes, Chief. The chauffeur. Yes, he's called Petrini. Don't be long. Mm. Get some sleep, jean Now I'll doze here at my desk until Paul Lapointe rounds up the chauffeur. So, Signor Petrini, tell me why your mistress went out to phone last night. Inspector, I did not know she went to phone. She says she wants to breathe the air. Yes. She tell me to wait for her at the door. Do you look after her at night sometimes? Oh, when her maid has a night out, monsieur. A night off, Petrini. Off. Oh, off. Yes, yes, yes. I have to be around in case she needs support, you see, monsieur. Mm, to carry her if she's too drunk to walk, I know. Tell me, Petrini, do you drive madame out regularly to any particular place? Oh, two or uh, three times a week she gets me to drive her to the English pub on the Rue de Ponteux. Mm. The Pickwick, I think. 
That in the early evening. Well, doesn't she go out in the afternoon, shopping or visiting? Well, she goes out many afternoons, but without the car, I do not take her. Well, where does she go? Have you any idea? She leaves about uh, four o'clock to go to the cinema, her mate tells me. She comes home by taxi about uh, seven. Well, when she arrives home from these afternoons, is she very drunk? No, monsieur. Then she is sober. But she needs a little drink. Does she speak to you about things, Petrini? Ah, sometimes. When she's a not a real drunk and she's a crying, she say, I wonder if I can bear this uh, sort of life much longer. She's a very unhappy woman, I think. Yes, I think she is also. And Monsieur Ch Sabin Levesque, what does she say about him? Oh, she say it is all his fault. But I will not answer because of my boss. He's a good man. Do you know what has happened to him, Monsieur? Because I worry that something bad make him vanish. Mm, so do I. And on the 18th of February, when he left the house, you didn't drive him? No, Monsieur. He did not ask for me. I drove him in the morning to a client, yes. Then... I not see him again. Mm, well, thank you, Signor. That's all. You've been very helpful. Yes, yes. Uh, one, one thing. Don't tell Madame Sabin Levesque about the things I've asked you. Oh. I understand? Uh, no, Monsieur. I will speak only silence to her. Somehow or another, Jules, I think you were going round in circles, one clue snapping at the tail of the other. Yes, it looked like it. I sat at my desk after the chauffeur had left, thinking precisely that. Anyhow, you had established that Monsieur Charles left for a rendezvous one evening and never arrived. So it was likely that some unpleasantness had taken place. Pity. I did see him for a moment as clearing off, leaving everything, and like Gauguin, finding a southern island. I wondered about that too, but what would he have done? He didn't paint, not even as a hobby. Now, his hobbies, so far as I could tell, were restricted to one thing. As his wife's were restricted to drink. Or were they? Lots of questions buzz around her behavior, don't they? Why give herself a false past? If she thought her telephone was being tapped, she must have had a reason for thinking so. Who did she have to telephone late at night? And where did she go those afternoons when she left the house at four? We needed to find out. I had two men watching the house with instructions to follow her at all costs. And then the phone rang. It was a commissioner for the 15th arrondissement. A man's body had been fished up out of the Seine at the Quai de Carnel. Credit cards, checkbook, wallet still on him. We had found Monsieur Charles. Yes. That's him. Oh, thank you, Monsieur Le Carreur. Now, come away now. The smell, I know, is always nauseous. Poor, poor Monsieur Gerard. Have you let his wife know? Well, I've sent Inspector Lapointe to see her and tell her. I didn't want her down here, but I needed to be quite sure it was him, so I sent for you. Did he... did he throw himself in? I mean, the most unlikely people do. No, I think he was thrown in. Now, Dr. Paul's over there. He's had a look at the body. Uh, Paul, anything to tell me? Uh, found these keys on the body. If you want them, I'll have them sterilized and sent you in the morning. Oh, thank you. That could be helpful. Do you know how he died? Somebody hit him on the head with a blunt instrument. Car jack, perhaps. Many times. His ankles were bound very tightly with wire. Probably... Yeah, on the wire was a heavy weight, you can be sure. Mm. Like your, uh, probably it was cut away by a ship's propeller. Oh, thanks, Paul. Do let me have the keys in the board. Yes, I will. Uh, first thing. I think I need a strong drink. I don't think my stomach likes the atmosphere one bit. I know how you feel, monsieur. Now, there's a bar around the corner. I'll come with you. I'll be at Bert's Bar if you want me. All right. So he was murdered. Oh, it's unbelievable. Like a... like a bad dream. Yes, he wasn't the sort of man one expected it to happen to. Poor Monsieur Charles. Uh, Monsieur who? Well, in the clubs, the girls he picked up, they knew him as Monsieur Charles. Here's the bar. You need a brandy. Uh, Chief Inspector, those keys, they're for his desk, his large mahogany desk in the flat. Ah, uh, I was hoping they were, Monsieur. I need to unlock a few further secrets. 
And I will, of course, get a search warrant and try to keep out of Madame Natalie's way. Hmm. It's an impressive desk, Chief, isn't it? Well, this seems only to have writing paper. Gold pen. Not very helpful. Oh, there's photos in this one. Hmm? Well, they look interesting. Let me see. Natalie, 20 or so, with Monsieur Charles. Looked pretty, wasn't she? Hmm. Well, tarty. No. Tarty, you say? Well, what about this? What sort of a smile is that, and uh, <laughs> little else? Natalie? What? It looks like a high-class call girl. On the back, the name Klika. A good call girl name, eh? And we know where our solicitor looked for his lady friend. Having fun? Ah, it's you, is it? Trika? Your maid has told you I hope we have a search warrant. Oh, she didn't. Why do you call me Trika? One of your jokes, is it? <laughs> Not very funny. Not all that funny, Natalie. Ah, I didn't realise what a fine garden you have here. Just show her the photo of what. What a fine garden. It has the name Trika on the back, madame. It was a part I was playing in some theatrical thing. I think you were once a hostess in a nightclub, and I propose to find out unless you save me the trouble. You can go to hell. Where do you go in the afternoons, Natalie? What afternoons? Look, I haven't had your phone tapped, you know. I don't care if you have, copper. Don't you? Then you must have an odd liking for phone books. At least I can be alone in them, not have coppers all over the place. Look, I'm not giving up, you know, Natalie. Oh, it's not piss off. Your husband was brutally murdered. I don't like any murder, but what was done to him is something I dislike even more. He asked for it. God, he asked for it. Well, what do you mean, Natalie? What do you mean? I'm going to have another drink. Uh, Stop her, Lebrun. Uh, look, just uh, stay still, madame. Uh, pigs! Pigs! Uh, he asked for it because he mixed with the worst riffraff in those clubs. With those women. Some pimp killed him. Some pimp... Do you know how he died, Natalie? I don't care how he died. I don't want to know. Oh, clear off! Clear off! He was hit on the head with a heavy, blunt instrument. Not just once, but over and over again until his skull was in small pieces. Ah! Hello, LaPointe. What can I do for you? Oh, hello, Perry. Well, the chief wondered if anyone in the vice squad but no other club still going run by the same person as 15 years ago. And who's the photo? Well, he wondered if anybody might recognise her. Uh, look. Hmm. He's got a hope. It's the Sabah Lavic woman, isn't it? When young. On the game, was she? Oh, we think so. But we're not sure. Look, it'll take me a year to put that photo and the name Trika through all our records. It's something the computer can't do yet. Tell the chief to go and talk to Blanche Bonnard. She's 50 now and still as sexy as she was at 30. She's had two clubs for over 15 years and there's not a soul she doesn't know and nobody she's forgotten. Blanche Bonnard, 107 Avenue de Vagran. I suppose you've come, Chief Inspector, because of the Sabal Levesque business. Mm. I was expecting you one of these days, but I'd no idea it'd be so quick. No, please go on, Madame Bonnard. It seems I've no need to ask a single question. Do you mind if I smoke my pipe? I should expect you to, Monsieur. Thank you. When I saw that picture of Madame Sabal Levesque, I thought I recognised her from somewhere, so I went through my albums. You knew her when she was Trika? Mm -hmm. I knew her when she was called Trika. Here you are, you see, in this album. Uh, thank you, madam. Hmm. That photo was taken soon after they first met. Uh. You recognise him, I'm sure. Monsieur Charles, as we knew him, as everybody knew him until the other day. Did he first meet her in your club? Yes. She could look very innocent, and she was very young. Just the sort of girl for Charles. He noticed her the moment he came in that evening, went over to her table and asked her to go off with him, but she refused. But obviously he didn't give up. He came back every evening for a week before she finally agreed. She came back a few days later to fetch her things. I asked her, madly in love, Trika. I remember that she only looked at me in reply with that funny, almost not seeing you look. A couple of months later, I saw the marriage splashed over the papers. 
No, it wasn't a happy marriage, I'm told. Shah returned to his old tricks in no time. Sad. Sad, Madame Rahn. Worse for Monsieur Shah. Ah, but she's free now and rich. Is that what's bothering you, monsieur? Was it foul play? Very. He was bashed on the head. Oh. A lot more that was necessary to kill him. Hmm, but would a woman be capable of that? Well, some women, but not her, though. She didn't do it, of that, I'm sure. But she had a hand in it. I have no evidence. But you're looking for it. Well, what are you going to do next? Well, she doesn't live far from here. I think I'll visit the lady. Not that it'll do any good. Somehow I can't keep away from the wretched woman. Well, you must have a glass of port before you go. No, oh, thank you, madame. I shall enjoy that. Uh, Chief Inspector, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Petrini. I'd like a few words with madame, your mistress, please. Oh, monsieur, she's not in. She go out. I don't think so, Petrini. Tell her I shan't keep her long. Well, she go out, monsieur. I see her go 20 minutes. Back. Look, Petrini, I had two inspectors watching this building. I opened the door for her 20 minutes. Jean Vier, come over here, will you? Perhaps my inspector was asleep, so we'll ask him. What is it, Chief? Neither you or Lorty have seen Madame Nathalie leave the building in the last 20 minutes, right? Ah, uh, no. Uh, the only person to go in or out has been a junior clerk through the office door. Mm. Nobody in or out from the Saban Le Vector. Oh, no, 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 monsieur. She lived by the garden door, like always. There is a door out from the garden. See, si, see, si, a little door in the wall onto a passage at the back which go onto the road de Tivoli. Madame always has the key. Mm-hmm. You'd only noticed the garden 48 hours before, I believe. Yes, it's so, Georges. A real hidden garden, but quite large. And to one side of the building, you could only see it from two windows in the flat. When I first saw it, the thought did cross my mind, but not firmly enough, obviously. So while your chaps had dutifully watched the front, Natalie had come and gone as she wished by the back. Mm. We were soon to discover where she went, by the way. You put a watch on the garden door, of course? Yes, on the principle of the stable door and the horse. Now, they saw her come back about an hour after I left. And you rushed round to ask her where she'd been? No, not this time. We'd find out, I thought, when she flitted out next time. Now, that evening, she took an overdose of sleeping tablets. But her maid found her in time, and her doctor cleaned her out. Hmm. It sounds as if something had come to a crisis. I felt that, too. The next morning, I was called in on the death of a young man in his apartment in the Rue Jean Goujon. Five bullets in the chest had killed him. Joe Fazio was his name. A barman and a pimp who'd been living in Clover for two years. And when I arrived, Dr. Paul and Lapointe were already there. See the look on his face, Megre? Yes. Absolute astonishment. He was shot point-blank with a small caliber gun five times. By somebody he knew. Hence the astonishment. Mm. Has the weapon been found, Le Point? No, Chief. The concierge is outside. I think she can help. She's a bright little woman. I'll have her in. Do come in, madam. Chief Inspector Maigret? Mm, I'm working on a hunch, madam, so I'll keep my questions to the point. Did the dead man have many visitors? No, uh, just one lady. Every day? Oh, most days, monsieur. In the afternoons. Describe her to me. Oh, well-dressed. A real lady. About 40. Oh, dark and thin. Oh, show her Natalie's photo, Le Point. Oh. Is this her, madame? Oh, yes. Yes, most certainly it is. And was she here yesterday afternoon? Oh, yes, monsieur, oh, but only for a short while. I've come from the Rue Jean Goujon, Natalie. Already? Did he threaten to denounce you as his accomplice if we picked him up? No. Worse than that. He wanted money to keep quiet. Blackmail. Mm. Did you love him? I had no illusions. He was my last chance. Uh, you had to get rid of Monsieur Charles. Have you got a light? Oh, yeah.
Thank you. Yes, it must have been rotten. You took to the bottle. I imagine you had lovers, too. One night stand. Men I met in bars. Hotel rooms. Some offered me money. Thought I was a common tart. And then you met Joe Fazio. Two years ago. That was different. I loved him. He wanted money to keep quiet, and he was going to leave me, go back to Marseille. I couldn't bear the thought. Whose idea was it to kill your husband? I think we both had the idea. Joe did it. It was easy. Gerard was on his way to some girl. It was a quiet street. Joe stole a car and took the body to the Seine. What sort of life would you have led with Joe? I don't know. I never thought about it. It wasn't out of love for him that you got him to kill your husband, was it? He just wanted him dead so you'd be the undisputed mistress of the household. The rich widow. I wanted him dead. That's true. He was so childish. So selfish. You mean he was king of the castle and you counted for very little? Every single one of them hated me. Well, in spite of everything... I feel sorry for you, Natalie. I suppose you're going to take me away with you. I am. And to be honest with you, I wish I didn't have to. I'm going to have another drink. It doesn't make me drunk today. They won't let me have any in there, will they? He's being buried tomorrow, isn't he? And I'm being buried today. I'm ready when you are, monsieur. A very enigmatic lady, Jules. Or do you think that, like so many people we call enigmatic, she was always playing one of many roles? The role of a murderess? For the fun of it? Oh, I can't believe it. But she'll always remain a mystery to me. <laughs> she led me a merry dance. Up the garden and through the garden gate. Well, not only that. Mm -hmm. no, somehow the more I questioned her, the less I knew. I think she probably used her drinking to advantage, even. Giving herself time to think. Indeed. I wonder if she hadn't shot her lover, she might have got away with it. Do you think so? Well, I doubt if we'd have been Monsieur Charles' murder on her lover. It's unlikely we'd have found any hard evidence. And yet she knew that once her lover was found shot, you'd know where to look. So she didn't care anymore? Perhaps. But she was back in the cleft stick situation, wasn't she? He'd have blackmailed her more and more. So she chanced her arm. One has to feel sorry for her, as you did. That I understand. Yes, it all went wrong. She thought marriage would be a bit of roses. But she didn't understand that Monsieur Charles couldn't and wouldn't change. And she was the last woman who should have married him. You see, in her own way, she wasn't so very unlike him. In Maigret and Monsieur Charles by Georges Simenon, translated by Marianne Alexandre Sinclair, and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam, Maigret was played by Maurice Denham, and Simenon by Michael Goff. La Pointe, Jean Rye, Jean Vier, Sean Barrett, Natalie, Sheila Grant, Le Cureur, Cyril Chaps, Blanche Bonnard, Pauline Letts, Martine, Nicolette Mackenzie, Mocco, Douglas Blackwell, Petrini, Michael Goldie, Dr. Paul, Jeffrey Siegel, and the concierge, Anne Rosenfeld. The play was produced and directed by Betty Davis.